Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it really is a fantastic pleasure to be back in Sarama. I'd just like to begin by thanking the organizers, Sarama Museum, the local authorities, and not least the venue as well um, for this, this marvelous lecture hall. We all know at least something about the Sarma boat burials. As you've heard, they really were an archaeological revelation, one of the most significant discoveries of the past century in Iron Age studies anywhere. They're also a watershed in the exploration of the Eastern Baltic during the early medieval period. And for obvious reasons, this is a discovery with implications far beyond Estonia. Over the next two days, you're going to be hearing a lot about the Salma burials themselves. What I want to talk about today is a kind of wider context. How do the excavations and the findings connect to the wider study of the Viking Age in Scandinavia and elsewhere? And from my point of view, how does, um, how does this connect with research uh, that we're doing at Uppsala University? Um, how does that link with the Salma project in Tallinn? In the, uh, in the title of this talk, you, you saw that phrase, the Viking phenomenon. This is the title of a research project that's been running at Uppsala since 2016 and will continue until 2025. Um, awarded by the Swedish Research Council, we're very fortunate to have 5 million euros. I'll take a deep breath when I say that. Um, I'm the, uh, the director of that project. Um, then we have a core team of my Uppsala colleagues, Dr. Frolot Hjernofrana Jonsson and Dr. Jon Jungqvist, both of whom are here today and they'll be speaking at the conference. And then there's a, a larger team of international researchers and postdocs. So I'm going to begin by telling you a little bit about what this project is trying to do. And in the course of that, I hope you'll see how it connects to Salma in very specific ways and also the more general kind of research agenda of the project. As you can imagine, when you're um, thinking of applying for five million euros, you have to come up with a good reason for somebody to give it to you. Um, so when I, I sat trying to plan this, I was thinking to myself, what aspects of the Viking Age have been explored in other research projects over the past 20 years or so, in the 2000s? And I'm not going to read through this entire list, but this is sort of the kinds of things that have been studied all over Scandinavia and Northwestern Europe. Issues of migrations, power, kingship, um, rural settlement, towns, trade, warfare, other things like art, handicrafts, production, burials, gender, identity, ideology, religion, and so on. And thinking about this very large project, I had to come up with something that essentially wasn't on that list. So I then had to ask myself, what is missing, maybe neglected, maybe new, in terms of our exploration of the Viking Age. And what I settled on was going back to a very old question, a fundamental question. We all talk about the Viking Age, but how and why did that begin? Why did the Scandinavians start moving out into the world at such a scale at that time? So the Viking Phenomenon Project is about origins. And they might be social, cultural, political, economic, anything. Beginnings of the Viking phenomenon. And also the legacies that it's left behind. So what I'm going to do today is just give you an overview of what we're trying to do. And then specific connections with the Salma project at Tallinn. And I think to start, it might be helpful to clarify some kind of terms of conditions. What are our sort of starting points for studying this? Now, this might sound a slightly strange thing to begin with, but the idea that the Viking Age existed 
it actually happened. Obviously, it's an artificial term. Nobody woke up in, sometime in the, in, the ninth, in the eighth century and, and realized that the Viking Age was starting tomorrow. You know, it's an artificial concept. There's a lot of debate about this in Viking studies. Should we still talk about a Viking Age? Should we talk about Vikings? Should we choose new terms, new vocabularies to describe all of this? Our starting point is that beyond those debates on terminology, the concept of the Viking Age has a testable reality. There's a reason why we think about it. And we can illuminate that um, by the application of theory and also comparative analysis. So that's our first point. The second one is about chronology. Um, archaeologists get terribly excited by chronology. You, you know, the traditional Viking Age begins with the raid on the monastery of Lindisfarne in June 793, which frankly is an even more ridiculous way to think about it. Um, no, nobody woke up on the 7th of June and realised the Viking Age was starting tomorrow. Obviously, it's something more diffuse. But we want to go a bit further than that and try and break down some of those boundaries. And this is a particular connection to Salma. We're wondering whether we need to critically dismantle the artificial border between what in Sweden is known as the Vendel period, that's the centuries just before the Viking Age, and the Viking Age itself. So we're tending to focus on the period from about 750 to 850 and the decades either side. And note that the date of the Salma burials is right on that border. If there's one thing that I hope people will take away from the 10 years of this project, it's this, that the people of the Viking Age, however we define it in time, were individuals every bit as complicated and varied as we are. And for me, the only question to follow that is why would anyone imagine that they were not? I think this sounds really obvious, but you might be surprised by how many people resist this. There is no one simple Viking Age. There are as many different ones as there were people. And then something else. It's impossible to study the Viking Age without understanding and engaging with the weight of its impact today, positively and negatively. You know, you're all familiar with this from movies, TV dramas, um, exhibitions, music, all kinds of things, but also uh, its darker legacies of, of white supremacy and, and so on. These are things we have to think about, we have to um, engage with. The Viking Phenomenon Project is actually two sub-projects linked together, and then some of those have projects underneath them. So it's a big, a big uh, structure, as you'd imagine for something that has such a high investment and is going on for 10 years. One of, the, uh, one of the interesting things is that the Swedish Research Council do not assume that at the start of the 10 years, you'll know where you're going to end up 10 years later, which is very refreshing. Um, so we're, we're allowed to develop our research design as we go along. And part of this is also outreach to the public, communicating what we're doing and why. The first of these two overall projects um, we've called Viking Economics. And this strand is directed by Follot. She'll be talking about aspects of it later, I think tomorrow. And this is not really the economics of the Viking Age. It's the economics of Vikings, proper Vikings, raiding Vikings. It's the social processes that underpinned Vikingness. Now, this is going to get a bit, um, a bit boringly technical, but um, the, the basic starting point for this is that three things that tend to be brought out as characterising the Viking Age, raiding, slaving and trading, we think they are the same thing. They are part of the same integrated set of activities. One of the, this is a ghastly way to think about it, but it's a ghastly subject, one of the, the main products of raiding 
is the enslavement of human beings. And what do you do with them? You trade them. And it goes round and round in a cycle. We're looking at this in five different ways. Um, I won't go through these in detail, but looking at the idea of the Viking as pirate. Um, there's a lot of work done on pirates. They're complicated people. They're not just, you know, the ha ha matey kind of pirates and Jack Sparrow. This is it's quite a, a complicated set of ideas. We're looking at the demographics of Vikings, gender, identity, things like that. I've already mentioned slavery, this vast system of unfreedom that underpinned much of the Viking Age. And also the infrastructure of the war bands, the armies, the fleets. Um, if you just think of a, a Viking fleet of 200 ships, which is a conservative estimate for the later Viking Age, that's a lot of wood. It's a lot of iron to make the nails and the rivets. It's a lot of wool to make the sails. It's a lot of tar to waterproof the ships. It's a lot of labor to do all of that. You don't just buy a Viking ship. The economics of that are vast, truly vast. And then there's the mechanisms of exchange, not just trading and barter, something much more sophisticated. So those are the kinds of things we're looking at within this Viking economics strand. There's something else too. I started my sort of path in Viking at university in the mid 1980s. It was a different world to where we are now in 2022. Um, collaboration across the then Iron Curtain was basically impossible, at least if you came from Britain. That is changing. Unfortunately, um, since I started working on this presentation, it has changed again, as we all know. But there has been a change in the way we think about the Viking world. The notions of a Western and Eastern Viking Age, which are absolutely the norm when I started studying the Vikings, are gone and they are increasingly irrelevant in a new geopolitical reality, though that is changing. It's the same individuals that cross that enormous Viking world, a fluid diaspora that stretches ultimately from the eastern seaboard of North America to the Asian steppe. And we should talk about it in those terms. It's also clear that Viking groups were to a degree multi-ethnic. They were not only Scandinavian. These are the kinds of things we've been looking at in the first half of the project in Viking economics. Um, the project is just over halfway through now. And these are the, um, they link out to those subjects that I, I was just listing. Um, different aspects of the raiders, the armies, the fleets, aspects of slavery and trade. Um, and in white towards the, the lower part of the screen, um, things much more relevant to, to this part of the world. The structures of the Rus, the, the Scandinavians and others on the Eastern Baltic and the river systems of the East. Scandinavian contacts much further afield as well, on into and the Silk Roads, but especially between Scandinavia and the Baltic islands, mobility and interaction in the Baltic region. And this strand of the project is mainly working through conferences and workshops. There's an emphasis on internationalization, on networked research, collaboration and interdisciplinarity. Um, we've had eight of these workshops so far. Some of them are published. There's other volumes coming on the way. So this is very much a collective endeavor, the work of dozens and dozens of scholars. That's kind of the first half of the Viking Phenomenon Project. The other half is where Salma comes in directly. We've called it boat grave culture, um, focusing on Scandinavian societies at the start of the Viking Age. And this, this part of the project is directed by Jon Ljungqvist. He'll be talking about aspects of it later. And the key questions here are about the raids themselves. This is actual Vikings. Why and when and how did they begin? Where did the raiders come from? What social groups produced them? 
And why then? And why in that form? And were they part of something larger? And this part of the project is looking at two specific places. The Viking economic stuff was very general. This is very specific. One of them you recognize, Salma. The other is Valsjörda land in Sweden and that's the place you can see at the top of the screen and I'll talk a little bit about the connections between them. The Valsjörda Cemetery is a, a, a rather large hill you can see it here just north of Uppsala in central Sweden. It was excavated between the 1920s and 1950s by Uppsala University and essentially this hill you can see the plan on the right here is one enormous cemetery. There are 15 boat burials along the side of the hill. You can see them in a line here, these elliptical shapes. You can see them facing a river, which is down here. Believed to be the burials of men. And these boats are buried pretty much, with one or two exceptions, once per generation. And between those burials and around them are more than 60 cremations, and chamber burials, including the burials of women. And all of this spans um, the, the 6th to 11th centuries of, of the Common Era. There are some slightly earlier stuff as well. But what this means is we have this place giving us a window on one community's attitudes to death, but also to life, before and during the Viking Age. We can track the same community as they go into the Viking Age, as they go through that time period that we're interested in. I'm not going to say much specifically about Salma. The whole conference is about this, but, but you know. These two boats um, containing respectively seven and 34 men, at least, many of them with severe weapon injuries, very complicated rituals, intricate uses of material culture, the killing of birds and fish and dogs, and the possible, we could argue about this for, for weeks, the possible presence of a king. Oops. Yeah. Now this is where we start bringing Valsierda and Salma together. This is why I and my colleagues are here today at all. Isotope analyses have shown very clearly that almost all the Salma men in the Salma boats came from central Sweden, probably the Mela Valley. There might be four from Gotland, from the island. There are close affinities with the material culture of the upland boat grave cemeteries. Not only that, there's other artefacts as well, but there is clearly very close links. It is possible that the Salma people may even be the Valsierda people. And if they weren't, they lived down the road. They must have known them. There's also um, the, the work of ADNA, which we'll also be hearing about later on, which suggests that the, the Mela men in the Salma boats came from a very extended kind of family group. They're not directly related, but, but they're, they're from the same sort of community, very clearly. There's even four brothers buried side by side. It's difficult to add ethnic labels to this, but this really does look as if it is an armed force of the sphere, the people of central Sweden. A sphere expedition, presumably gone wrong, uh, very wrong, um, there's critical implications for the nature and the date of early expeditions of this kind. This is 50 years before Lisbon, before that classic beginning of the Viking Age. And this is in the east. This is in the Baltic, not in the west. The Salma project is quite clearly independent of what we're doing in Uppsala, just to be absolutely clear. Project director, Dr. Yuri Pitts, who will be speaking um, later today. The core post-excavation team, who also worked on the excavation, um, they're here today too. Um, Italian University, Marga Konsa from, from Tartu as well. The connection between these two projects is that um, 
part of the Salma post-excavation work, the analysis of the finds and the publications where we have the possibility to fund that from the Viking Phenomenon Project. So that is the link between the two. It's also part of our work in Valsierda. I mentioned all those, those, um, those graves there. Um, the, the Uppsala department is, is, has a kind of debt of guilt about Valsierda. As I said, they were excavated from the 20s to the 50s. But b before our project started in 2016, only six of the 15 boat graves were published and none of the other burials. Part of what we're doing in our project is publishing the whole of the Valsierda Cemetery. So this is the connection between the two sites, from Valsierda to Salma, and I want to stress this is in metaphorical terms, not absolutely literally, but if you like, the first Vikings, proper Vikings, at home and away. The connection between these two sites is absolutely unique in Northwestern Europe. It has relevance to Sweden, it has relevance to Estonia, and it has relevance, frankly, to the whole Viking world. So in the last few minutes, um, halfway through the project, I just want to give you a few um, thoughts about where we are, the kind of conclusions that we're coming to. The first of it is about dating. Remember, I, I, I spoke about trying to erase that border between the Vendel period and the Viking Age. Like the name of this conference, Vikings Before Vikings. It's quite clear that Scandinavian links with Europe go back millennia. This is not a Viking phenomenon, even in the East. There is a clear presence in Scandinavia of imported items, luxury things, um, prior to the Viking Age. There's, there's garnets from India and Sri Lanka. There are shells from the Gulf, cameos from, Byzanti from Byzantium and more. There is an active trading connection even to the overland and maritime silk roads that goes at least as far back as the 500s, maybe more, with links ultimately as far as China, Silla in Korea and Nara, Japan. We've kind of known about this for a long time, but there's been remarkably little curiosity about how that works. And it's a very Viking kind of phenomenon. So what we're talking about is the long late Iron Age. In Scandinavia, there has long been known something that's uh, sometimes been called the crisis of the migration period. It was raining all the time, as you can see. Um, from the late 400s to the end of the 6th century. And to differing degrees all over Scandinavia, there is a decline in the numbers of settlements and cemeteries and indications of, of human presence. Why? There's no one reason. There's lots of argument about it. It's still a debate. Is it a matter of economic disruption in the wake of the decline of the Roman Empire? discontinuities in trade and production, political instability, is it war, what's going on? Um, there's also this idea of severe environmental impacts from volcanic eruptions in the 530s, lots of different things. But the question for us is, can we see in the gradual recovery from that crisis, whatever caused it, a break with an earlier way of life and the beginnings of something different, if we're looking for the roots of the Viking phenomenon. So if you look at Scandinavia on the eve of the Viking Age, the 200 years before Salma, you can see these new militarized elites, you can see the hall culture that sustained them. If you've read Beowulf, that is what it's about. A deeply hierarchical society, very aggressive, expansionist, projecting itself in monumentalized landscapes of settlement and burial um, with kind of a whole religious apparatus around it. And this isn't just the elites, this implicates everybody in society at that time. 
So why did the Viking Age begin? There's been some quite amusingly titled papers on this, not by us, over the last few years. What caused the Viking Age? A few years later, what really caused the Viking Age? And, uh, and on we go. Um, essentially, a kind of a, a menu of determinism. Is it about technology? Is it about the environment? Is it about population pressure, economic pressure, political change? ideology? Or is it something more about social context, about the way in which people interact? Um, is it all of the above? And I think part of the mistake here is looking for what in English is called a smoking gun, the thing that explains it all. And in our project, we don't think there is a thing. Um, there is no single cause or trigger. We think it is what is going on at the start of the Viking Age is the logical extension of lots of different processes coming together that have been in motion for centuries. And this is, the, I think, the crucial thing. A lot of what constitutes the Viking Age, what we think of about Vikings, has been going on inside Scandinavia for a long time. And what the Viking Age is about is the export of all of that outside Scandinavia. We think initially in the east and then gradually to the west. And it gathers speed. It's very little in the beginning. These raids, two or three ships, a hundred men, something like that. Fifty years later, there are armies of thousands of Vikings. It moves fast, but slowly in the beginning. That long distance trade also followed the same paths as it had done for centuries, but this time the Scandinavians are going out to meet it. When? Roughly the mid 8th century, plus or minus 20 years. So we're looking at a 40 year period when all of this is coming together. And again, think of the date of Selma, 750 or thereabouts. It is right in the middle of that. And together with this is also individuals. I've been talking about processes, kinds of people, individual agency. People seeking individual improvement, wealth, land, better social prospects, political advancement, connections, or just a different life the same reasons people move around today. Everybody caught up in the same events and processes, this Viking phenomenon, but for different reasons and with different agendas. Remember that thing I said at the beginning about the, Vi the Vikings are individuals just like us. And some of them were aware of this. Some of them were trying to move it in their direction. Other people were not but all of that across this massive world of encounters. So the familiar map of the Viking Age with all these arrows where the Scandinavians go, but a slightly different kind of diaspora to the one that we've become accustomed to thinking of. And Selma is in a central position for that. There's also just finally those contemporary legacies playing out in all different kinds of ways, as I mentioned, positive and negative. This was a, a real priority of the Swedish Research Council when they funded this project. Um, it's seen as quite an urgent social issue in Scandinavia to really talk about what Vikings mean, how we talk about them. There are some quite simplistic narratives of what the Viking Age is. Um, something that we're trying to complicate. It's a time that is not homogenous. You've, you've gathered this is where we're going in this project. And I think beyond the stereotypes, the reality was a Viking age of many ethnicities, many identities. It had diversity, it had difference, but all of that filtered through views of the world that were sometimes very, very different to our own. And that complexity is something that we need to try to communicate, both within the academy 
and I think to the public. And if I've been studying Vikings for more than 30 years, obviously I think they're really interesting. I think they're fascinating, but that's not necessarily the same as admirable. And we need to be careful about that. One of the ways that we're talking about this is through touring exhibition. So there's been most of the Valsierda finds um, have been touring the United States for several years now. They're just about to come back to Sweden. And, and Salma, the connection to Salma, is part of this exhibition mentioned. There's no, none of the artifacts, obviously, but this, the context. Salma is, is sort of moving around the world, and it's already a, a world-famous site, as you know. There's been a lot of outputs from this project. Um, in the first sort of six years or so, nine books, including a synthesis of the Viking Age, more than 50 journal papers, more than 90 conference presentations, lots of lectures to the public. Um, we've had our own seminar series, uh, working with schools, uh, articles in popular magazines and so on, lots of interviews. There's also a dedicated book series with Routledge, so other people publishing their work um, through the project. It's a, it's a very wide-ranging thing. And of course, very soon, the Selma report from Tallinn University that is going to be a major landmark in, in Viking studies. So, if we look at this Viking phenomenon project and the concept of the Viking phenomenon, it's very much a matter of challenges, a matter of possibilities. But this is something I really want to stress. We don't believe that there is a definitive history of the Viking Age. Um, that's the reason my book that you've just seen on the screen is called A History of the Vikings, not The History. Um, this is something that, that I, th I think is very important. You will find as many Viking Ages as there are scholars who study it and as many people in the public who are interested in it. And, and we have to be aware of those differences. I think promoting a kind of debate is, is really, really important. And I'm gonna um, end by quoting of, of that book I wrote, because um, I, ju I just like this phrase. When I first read it, I thought it was rather a bit trite, really, a bit, a bit simple. But the more I thought about it, the more I liked it. The better we understand the Vikings, the more comfortable we are with how little we actually know about them. And I take a lot of comfort in that. There's always more to learn. One of the great riches of archaeology is that our database is expanding all the time. The very subject of this conference, the Salma Boats, was totally unknown in 2007. That's not very long ago time is new material coming up and sometimes things that drastically change the Viking Age. I will be disappointed if somebody studying the Viking phenomenon or whatever they decide to call it in 10 years time will come to the same conclusions as we do. That's exactly how it should be, that it will change. So it's good to remember all of that. So um, with that, just thank you again to, um, to you for being here, to the organisers, um, and everyone who has uh, invited uh, international speakers to come here to Sarama to see the Salma site for some of you the first time um, and, and generally to be here in Estonia. So thank you very much. Thank you, Neil. And um, we do have some uh, time for uh, questions uh, until we continue with the next uh, lecture. Um, is there anyone from the audience who would like to start? <coughs> or not, it's fine. <laughs> Edi, where are you? Do you want to have a go? Yeah, I've got, I've got some questions, but not... How does this work? Does that work? It's working. Talk, yeah. talk into Whoa. it. This is good. Um, <laughs> so, I'm going to dive straight into the deep end and ask you some of your thoughts about the Salma boat burial 
So what I noticed from your presentation, you weren't mentioning very much about mortuary drama and your notions, I'm thinking way back before this project, so you're passing into poetry mm. paper, for example. There were two very seductive notions you came up. One, that when you're excavating something like a boat of the nature of Salma, it could be seen as the end of a play, like a Shakespearean play. But with the caveat, yes, but with the caveat that the drama might have repeated itself over several different days or nights mm. as different peoples or types of peoples came. And the end result in the archaeological record is a compilation of stuff from several nights. Um, yeah, so throwing you straight into the deep end, I know it's a little bit of a side question. Is that notion still valid for you or does it apply for Salma or, or what are your current I, thoughts? I think that, thank you for the question. I, I think it, it is still valid for me. Um, one of the, the I think the, the most striking things about Viking Age burial or burial practices is that although we have a relatively limited number of types of burial at the broadest level, like boat burial or chambers or cremations under mounds, things like that, the moment you go inside each individual burial, they're all different. There is this absolutely endless complexity. And I think that must have a reason, it must have a meaning. They're not just throwing things in a hole. And if you look at Salma, the, I think two things strike me about this, even, I mean, there are so many, many things. But one is how complicated it is. Think of all the actions needed to do that. It's a lot. Um, and the other thing is it must have taken a long time that you don't put this together in an hour. Um, and the time required to do that, having the time to do that, and why you put all those things together, I think there must be a story, and I suspect it's a literal story. They are telling a story or communicating something. And these burials, not just Selma, but others like them, they are statements and, and they're designed to stay there and carry on talking to the people moving around them. And if you think about the location of, of the Salma burials that we'll hear, oops, we'll hear more about later, um, these are things that would be seen in one way or another um, by the people of, of Sarama, by people moving past, by people coming in, travellers, everybody. And I think that idea of, of meaning in the, in the Selma burials is something we'll be talking about for decades, trying to work out what on earth this means, the, the relationship between the ships. Why is this man buried in that way and another one buried slightly differently? It's, it's yeah, I, I think that is still valid. Uh, thank you. Vishka, uh, throw it. <laughs> um. Kas meil on veel küsimusi või jätkame? Do, uh, do you have any more questions or we continue? Show your hands, please. <laughs> well caught. <laughs> so you mentioned that uh, you see evidence of violence uh, even before the so-called Viking Age, so local raiding and so on. Uh, so I have heard that uh, the people of the Indo-Europeans or the Yamnaya who reached uh, Northern Europe have, have been called the um, most violent people uh, of the earth. Uh, this is, of course, an exaggeration, but uh, can you see a continuum of, uh, of a highly violent society in Scandinavia uh, throughout these uh, millennia until Vic the Viking era? Or is this um, local reading and, uh, and so on... Uh, uh, when does it begin, so to say? I think that um, the... Uh, I certainly don't think the, the people living in what is now Scandinavia are kind of uniquely violent or anything. I don't think there is any long-term tradition like that. I think you can find violence in prehistory almost everywhere. Um, I, I don't think it's a unique thing for Scandinavia in, in any sense. And the, the raiding that is going on in Scandinavia is essentially competition between little tiny states that would rather like to become bigger states at the expense of their neighbours. Um, and I think you can see an increasing social hierarchy, but not uh, a, some kind of fundamentally violent culture. I wouldn't say that, no. 
kui kellegil on veel üks kiire küsimus, selle If somebody has one more short question, we could listen to it. It seems no more questions. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah.